Black is even. Oh, I'm going to record that too. Is that okay? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, well, it's not like mine. No. Three <laughs> hours, <it's laughs> like, if you want to hit the X on the auction, I don't think it might be right. I'm getting what? So, hello, I am Sinead, and I am a visual artist, and I'm going to talk about how to pretend you know stuff about stuff, basically, or collaborative arts practice, as it's better known. Um, so, I work mostly in uh, what's called lens-based media, which is a very posh way of saying that I take photographs and videos, usually. Um, but sometimes I also do some physical computing. Um, my master's was uh, called Art in the Digital World, which is a fine art master's from NCAD. Um, we did mostly sort of contemporary art practice and the sort of usual artsy sort of stuff, but we also did a small bit of things like Arduino processing, Pure Data, Max MSP, Blender, actually, um, things like that. But because it was mostly art students who were in there who don't know anything, I was actually the techie person. I know people who are here will laugh at that. You know me will laugh at that. Um, so yeah, so you were kind of it was very much an introduction. At, a, at an introductory sort of level, and it was if you wanted to go forward with it, then you sort of figured it out on your own, or you got extra tutorials or whatever. So what that means is that basically when I'm working on physical computing stuff, I need lots and lots of help. And that's where collaborative practice comes in. And I should make a point now that um, when I'm talking about collaborative practice, sometimes it does just mean somebody helping me, and that's brilliant, and that's a lot of what I get here. But usually when I talk about collaborative practice, it's more than just uh, an engineer coming and making an art piece work, or an artist coming and prettifying a piece of engineering. It's more about a real give and take between the two people and between disciplines. Between, I work a lot with science as well. So it's more about a sort of an emergent thing that happens when different disciplines come together. So you might have a scientist, an engineer, and an artist all working together. And there's this kind of gestalt thing that happens where they become more than the sum of their parts. So I just wanted to make that point before I start telling you what everybody else does for me. So um, this is the first sort of collaborative piece that I made. Um, this is called Dr. Dupas Patented Phrenologoscope and Psychiograph. Um, this I made for the first um, Mini Maker Fair in 2012. Mm -hmm. In 2012, yeah, in Dublin. Um, I made this with um, Ben Golong and members of the Recyclers and Pack Lab. I wasn't a member here at the time. Um, I'll just explain briefly that my master's, the research of my master's was on um, portraiture and the seat of authorship in portraiture. So basically where the story comes from. You know when you look at a photograph of a person, you make up a story. Or there is a story in a photograph. And we always see an inherent story in a photograph or an image of a person. And my research for over two years was looking at where that comes from. So whether it comes from the photographer or the sitter or the viewer, or sometimes a mixture of all three. Um, and this particular project was kind of stripping it down to haha, bare bones um, and looking at um, uh, phrenology, which is a very old sort of really horribly racist, defunct pseudoscience that was around in Victorian times. Um, a lot of the work that I do also looks at history of science as well. You'll see that as a sort of recurring um, theme. I like to mess with ideas of science and science fiction and kind of blurring lines between science and science fiction and narratives and truth and not so truth and things like that. So basically what it was was it was a kind of a Victorian penny arcade machine. You can't really see very well here but there's a 50 cent coin slot here and you put the 50 cent in. These were kind of blinky blinky lights that went around in a circle and you put the 50 cent in and press the button and the lights went around faster and faster and faster and this head here, there was a little red blinking LED and it started to blink and then when it did its calculations there's a slot here and you got a reading of your character. Um, so that's what it looked like from the front. This is what it looked like from the back. Um, so what it was was actually an Expedit unit from Ikea with some plywood stuck in the front. Um, the head was a, a massage a thing for practicing facial massage. Um, in amongst all of the LED wires, so the lights on the front were actually LEDs with ping pong balls stuck on the front. Um, the, uh, in amongst all these LEDs here, there's an Arduino somewhere, which was running Fermata um, into a pure data patch on a laptop here, which was then running BAT and command files through IRFAN view up to a printer, which then fed pre-printed <laughs> um, things through. So these are some of them. They were sort of on a thick, sort of cottony, cardboardy sort of paper. 
So these were these are two examples um, of what you got. So they were obviously they were pre-printed. Um, so I don't know if you can read any of them. So your benevolence reading is very large. So these are actually taken from the 1867 annual of um, phrenology, which was open source because it's old. Um, so it says um, your benevolence reading is very large. You are deeply and thoroughly imbued with the benevolent spirit. With large adhesiveness and moderate acquisitiveness, you are a little too ready to help friends, and with large hope added, are especially inclined to endorse for them, which you should forswear not to do. So there was a lot of stuff like that. So there were about 20 different ones. Um, it was kind of amazing how many people actually thought that it was doing what it said. It, it was all fake. <laughs> um, I kind of at the start, when I had started on the project, you know, you kind of had these big, huge ideas at the start of a project and then they end up in sort of this size. Um, what I had originally wanted to do was use the facial mapping software and actually have a webcam that actually mapped your face and to do some sort of reading to throughput it but uh, kind of ran out of time and energy, and um, so it was all completely faked and pre-printed, as I said. But I got lots of people, because it was the, I think the Institute of Physics or something had something on the same weekend, and I had lots of like actual physicists coming up and asking me how it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned from that, A, that people like Blinky Lights, B, that people like getting something, like a printout, and see that people are very easily fooled if you throw the right sort of science at them, or pseudoscience in this case. Um, from that, I sort of started to get really into the whole um, idea of science and history of science and all that sort of stuff. So I was invited to take part in a module in UCD, um, working with graduates and undergraduates in physics departments in UCD, called um, Tunneling Art and Physics. So again, we were looking at the history of physics. Um, so this is a Wilson cloud chamber that we made, which is basically a particle. It's the very first particle detector that was made, I think, in around 1913, I think, was the first one. So it's a fish tank turned upside down with um, some plasticine, black plasticine, and this is the bottom of the fish tank. And there's some felt at the top here and just a slight projector going through. And um, we decided to sort of do a Mythbusters on it. You can just get cosmic radiation. Um, but we decided to do myth busters on it, and there's a strontium disc in there somewhere as well, so for some added radiation. Um, and then you just put dry ice in the bottom, but again, we myth bustered it, and we put in dry ice and liquid nitrogen, just because we could. Um, so the idea is that the temperature gradient, you get these chemical, or chemical trails, oh, it's chemtrails, not chemtrails, <laughs> hot trails, like um, from um, airplanes. What they are actually is electrons, so it's decay paths of electrons moving through the space. So what I learned from this was that science kind of doesn't work most of the time. We did it, I think, five times with absolutely no variables, and it worked once. And this is what we got, um, which was, I have to say, this was incredibly exciting at the time. You're all jumping around. I don't know if you can see your oh, stuff. Um, there are, I'll see if I can just go again. Um, <coughs> There are tiny wispy things going on in the background. I don't know what this computer is doing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, there's open yeah. source for you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Pause. For a second. Uh, sorry about this. This always happens. Uh, cancel? Yeah. Cancel that. Yes. I should add actually that this was the only one that it would work in. I did actually try this in Microsoft Office. Uh, <coughs> oh, I have one. Uh, uh, yeah, so you might be able to see tiny wispy things, and they're actually electrons that you can see with the baby dog. And that was incredibly exciting, and it was amazing, and I'm going to turn it off before it crashes again. Um, but it was sort of the, the kind of have to be there moment, you know, it didn't really look that great. And it was so difficult to get to work in the first place that we decided not to show it in the gallery. What we were going to do was try and set it up in the gallery so that people would come in. There's a huge one in Berlin, in the Science Museum in Berlin, which is amazing, but they obviously had a lot more time and money to put into it. So we decided... To look, so this is the idea with collaboration, is instead of me sitting there going, okay, what do I do next? We, we sat down and we started to talk about particles 
And what else can you do with particles? So there's particles and there's waves, and there's particle wave theory. So we decided to look at the other side of it, which was wave theory. Um, so we made another sort of a contraction thing. And um, so this is a trusty slide projector again. And this is just a bar, this is a five volt motor here. And this is a variable voltage um, power thing in me who can see how well up I am on my tech. Um, and there was another another um, set up the same without the projector. And um, so what we did was we were just varying the voltage going through each of the five volt motors. So if you vary the voltage, then the motors spin at different rates. And what we wanted to see was how you can make standing waves, basically. So um, if you have a frequency, if the frequency and the amplitude of the wave going down here is the same as the reflected wave or a multiple of or divisible by as that, then you get what's called a standing wave. Um, and hopefully this video will work and not crash. Um, yes, so this is what we got. This is a real time video footage of what we got. So you can see just by varying the motor speeds, we were able to get different numbers of nodes. So that's when the motors are running at the same speed, and then when you turn it up, so when you get two nodes, these are nodes, you sort of the dips and in. So that's when they're running, one is running twice the speed of the other. And at one stage we had seven going, so we had one motor going seven times faster than the other. Um, I love the video and I love how it sort of jumps between this sort of state of um, equilibrium and like this, and then all of a sudden goes sort of into this mad state of flux and sort of instability and all that sort of stuff. But we decided that it was a bit too, I wanted to project it really big and have it in a really dark space, but it's a bit too sort of heavy after a while and horrible. So I also took some stills footage, which we ended up using a little bit more. So we had in the final show, we had the a small sort of old television in the corner showing the video. And then we had these stills on the wall. Um, I'll just go through a few of the stills. It'll take about a um, yeah, so just a series of these. I think there were about 30 something all in all, or 20 something all in all. So you'll see a setup of the actual gallery now. Yeah, so this is the actual gallery setup. This is in the atrium gallery in Temple Bar Gallery in the studio. So this is a Caterina. You always need a Caterina for scale. Um, a Caterina is just short of six feet. It's probably actually over six <laughs> feet in these shoes. Um, so you have this panel. Um, so this ceiling is like really, really high. Um, and these prints are six foot by four foot. So just playing with ideas of, of sort of having like Father Ted, like, you know, small and far away sort of thing. Like, so if you have something really small, like a waveform, and make it really big. Um, from that though, um, the real sort of collaborative effort from that though was uh, a separate um, project that I started to work on. Most of the research that I did for the particle tank, the fish tank particle detector and stuff was in this room, which is called Malloy. This is the Malloy collection in UCD, in the old building in UCD. It might not be there anymore, too. Um, but there are all these beautiful um, machines and stuff. This is where they keep all the um, original, what was it called? Physical, no, um, natural philosophy equipment from the early 18th century and 17th century and stuff. Um, before physics was even invented, so beautiful sort of brass and bronze and copper and all that sort of stuff, which I just completely fell in love with. And I'd also been to Ars Metier, and I discovered this object, which I just really loved. It's an it's a telegram machine, it's a field telegraph machine from <coughs> World War Two, I think, from the French um, army in World War Two, and I just loved the aesthetic of it and the valves and everything. So um, I started to work on this sort of story. Um, again, playing with ideas of truth and fiction and blurring lines of science and science fiction, I started to work on a story which um, eventually got published. And this is it. This is Hack Circus magazine. I don't know if anybody knows Hack Circus. If you're into art and tech or anything like this, then Hack Circus is well worth subscribing to and going to if you go to any of the events. Um, I've spoken to two of them there. So I wrote basically a short story um, where I said that I was doing research for the... Um, the fish tank detector and I came across this box and it was a, a box that nobody knew what the contents were and we discovered that in 1928 that it was made by a guy called Francis Mead um, who had published a paper in 1923 on Tallman's paradox and time travel. So there's a very famous thought experiment from 1910 I think from Einstein and a couple of other people 
um, called tachyonic antitelephone. So it was a purely theoretical device where you could use tachyons, which are superluminal particles, faster than light particles, to send a message <coughs> back to yourself in the past. So I really love this idea of it. It's like a tweet your 16 year old self thing where you could send a message back, kind of warning yourself of bad boyfriends or tragedies or, you know, don't take that job or whatever. So I kind of fell in love with that idea. But I wanted to put this sort of narrative onto it. So I made up this story anyway that we had found this box. Um, this is Thomas Paradox. Uh, so you throw lots of science at people and they kind of believe everything. Um, so the idea is, is that. Um, and this is a real thing, and the, 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 this is what I really like about this project actually, is that I worked with a theoretical physicist on it, through all of it. So all of the science actually works and it is real. It's the way it's kind of put together, it might be a bit sort of dodgy, but <laughs> in theory, anyway, everything should work. So Thomas Paradox basically says that if, the, if A, which is the effect, if the effect travels faster than the speed of light, then it can arrive before the cause. So you can break causality. So you can send messages back to your former self. It's one of these beautiful things in maths that works perfectly mathematically, but doesn't actually work in real life. Um, <laughs> so we ended up making this. And this is the, the tachyonic antitelephone. So basically the story that I made up was that we found this device, we found this crate, and we'd been given permission by UCD to rebuild it. And that um, I worked collaboratively collaboratively. So I'm going to have to actually read out how many people helped me with this because I can never remember. So um, it started at Science Hack Day a year ago in February last year. I met with Becky, Rob, Paul, Jeffrey, Dave McKeown, Seb, Duras and we worked, well they worked, I went home, um, and they worked <laughs> at 2am um, to get the Arduino, there's an Arduino in here, and they worked until 2 a.m. to get the Arduino to talk to the thermal printer inside. Then I started to work with John Renane, who's a theoretical physicist, and we went through all the physics stuff, he's in UCD. Then Rob Fitz designed the PCB and the software for me. Um, Gary and Paul from here as well did the hardware hacking. Well, I helped. I did actually, I didn't just, well, I did actually just sit there for some of it. Um, so we hacked an old flatbed scanner and um, uh, maybe took a part in our funny radio that was perfectly working. Um, and then <laughs> Gary, <laughs> Gary and Paul, yeah, Gary and Paul helped with the hardware hacking. Christian helped with making the box and a couple of other people as well. And then Becky kind of did absolutely everything else and is still doing things. I ran her in a panic last week. And um, so she designed all the software and everything for me. So there's a video that I hope will work. And um, so the idea is that the user puts their hand. You know, Lagging. user puts their hand on the flatbed scanner and the flatbed scanner moves down and it reads your your identity through your handprint um, and then I'm going to move it off actually or I'll move it back to the last yeah I'll just move here so you put your hand on it and you press scan and the flatbed scanner <laughs> <laughs> the flatbed scanner bed moves down and where am I ay, ay, ay. I'll skip that slide the flatbed scanner bed moves down, and then you put in a date cancel, cancel, and cancel. cancel. Yeah, hang on, I can't multitask. Sorry. The myth of women being able to multitask is just that I, I really cannot have absolutely no way of multitasking ever. So I can just get a pass on. Right. So um. You put your hand on the flatbed scanner, the flatbed scanner thing moves down, then you input a date, so there are rotary dials on the front, it's day, day, month, year, year, and then there's a little script that runs it through the Arduino, and the Arduino prints to the thermal, it sends a signal to the thermal printer, and you get a printout that you pull out. So again, it's blinky lights, or oh, there are valves with LEDs under them. So again, it's inputting button, this idea of being able to send a message back from yourself, which people love, um, and getting something at the end that people love. So I'll just read it, so it's just a few examples here of things that it says. Um, so date, month, year. Um, day eight of clown school. You started with such high expectations that you'd finally found your calling, but by now it's become very clear that you were wrong. You end the day in hospital following an anaphylactic reaction to a custard pie. So that's one. Um, then uh, the cue bots that form your home malfunction again. This time they have arranged themselves in the shape of the Great Pyramid of Giza. It takes you 50 minutes to find your bathroom. That's another. And then, just one more. 
Um, by year, the population's attention span has become so short that the best-selling novel you just published consists of a 30-word introduction, an infographic, and an accompanying TED talk. So they were kind of <laughs> silly and funny and all that sort of stuff. But um, I don't just work. A lot of the stuff that you've seen tonight is kind of flippant and a little bit silly and all that sort of stuff, but I do actually work in, with sort of heavier stuff and a lot of the photographic and video work that I do deals with issues around mental health and um, death and grief and bereavement and all that sort of stuff. So um, at the moment I'm looking at, I got this yoke, which is a true sense, it's a, an EEG, a wearable thing. So it reads, one of the things that it does is that it reads brain waves. Um, so what I want to do with this is I want to see if I can sort of pick up on emotions. I was at another hack circus there a couple of weeks ago in Sheffield and one of the other talkers was doing did a talk on how music can affect your emotions, how easy it is to manipulate emotions through music. Um, so I'm working with Ed here at the moment and um, a couple of other people. I'm hoping to work <coughs> with a cognitive scientist on this and waiting for an introduction to a cognitive scientist and then we're all going to Art Tech Circle, which I don't know if anybody's heard about. Art Tech Circle is an event that's running next weekend. Um, so what I'm hoping to do with this is to, you get this, um, this is the sort of output, it's one of the outputs that you can get. You can dump the, the raw data as well, but you can get, so you can get the signal to so the actual brain waves and then a spectrograph. So what I'm hoping to do with this is, my original idea was just to turn it into 3D models, so I could print different emotions, because I like the idea of emotions being objects and use maybe the wood resin stuff to print wooden emotions. Um, but then, again, this sort of collaborative process and bouncing ideas off each other and all that sort of stuff. Um, we've been talk I've been talking to my brother, who's, handily enough, is a composer, um, and we've been talking about maybe doing this sort of feedback loop where we get the, uh, they produce WAV files, so your brainwave it's, they're changed into WAV files, which are actually a, a, a music, they're a sound file. Um, and if you shift down the frequency, they're, they're too high for human hearing, but if you shift down the frequency, then you can hear them. So we were wondering, what if you were to record, say, the sound of sadness, and then play it back through a set of earphones, what sort of emotion would that create? And is it sort of self-fulfilling, or does it do this weird stuff? So we're just looking at loops at the moment, and. Um, maybe projecting onto a big wall and having a sort of multi-sensory thing. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. And again, it's a big collaboration with lots of different people because you can't do this sort of stuff by yourself. So that's it. So I don't know if anybody has any questions. We'll leave questions to the break because you slightly ran over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie is going to talk about Glenn.